Welcome to the Michigan Runner Show. Join us each time as we explore the people, the places, and the events that shape our great sport. All right, your golf experience actually helped you start in the different business of promoting golf resort. You know, that was a wonderful thing. My background in golf, even though I had quit playing golf, I got to Hawaii and there's all these beautiful, beautiful golf courses. Plus they didn't have a dress code. When you played golf in Hawaii, you could wear shorts. It wasn't the dress code of like, a, you had to wear a skirt no more than two inches above your knees. And I just, I love that. But uh, yeah, it was a wonderful thing. I met a gentleman by the name of Ted McAneely who was with the Prince Resorts, which is Mauna Kea Resort, Maui Prince at that time, and Hawaii Prince. And Ted had been a, a hockey player with uh, Edmonton the Edmonton Oilers and uh, Gretzky took his place oh, okay. but Ted was recruited by a company in Japan Cebu Ra Railroad to play hockey for their their company and then he ended up moving into the hotel business they owned the Prince Resorts in Hawaii and the first time I met Ted and started talking to him about I wanted to give golf clinics you know I thought I could do that or promote the the uh, the resorts nobody was really doing a lot of PR with golf resorts then because everybody went to Hawaii they didn't have the competition of Myrtle Beach and the Caribbean and, you know, all the places that people go now, Hilton Head for, for golf. P Hawaii was a destination for golf. And the response was by Ted was fantastic. He really kind of helped me launch my PR career in in uh, Hawaii for golf. And the beauty of it was the, the Montelani Senior Skins was starting at Montelani Resort with Arnold Palmer, Jack Nicholas, and Gary Player, and who else was that time? Um, Chichi Rodriguez. And they're... I got real involved helping them, and I so I was very engaged in that. So I got to know Arnold Palmer quite well, and and Ed Say. We used to go meet Arnold on this plane, but it isn't like it was uh, like the Ford Seniors in Dearborn, where you had thousands and thousands of, of spectators. Right, the Big Island of Hawaii. You know, a lot of people didn't really they weren't there to do spectator golf. So I got real involved, getting people to come out and watch the Senior Skins, getting volunteers for them, helping that event become the wonderful event that it was for. ESPN. It was always showed on the um, the Sunday before the Super Bowl. Do you remember? I don't know if you remember that, but that was a big deal at the time. When I look back, it was an, uh, such an honor for me to be so involved in that event. Same thing with the the uh, PGA uh, Champions Tour. They started the it was the Mastercard Championship 21 years ago, and they reached out to me to help them get inroads into the Big Island. Yeah, so from the very first year, I was heavily involved in that, working with Brian Goyne, actually, who had been the director of the Ford Seniors here, but he had been promoted to handling all the championship events. It was then called the Senior Tour. Brian and I used to have a lot of fun because I'd have him call into Paul W. Smith here because he had all kinds of friends in the media here. But they were really appreciative that I knew so much about the Big Island and knew about golf and could connect them with people. Big Island is what they call an outer island in Hawaii. So it's not as connected as Oahu to the media. So you kind of have to have those relationships to have things happen. So that was wonderful days. In those early days, Jack Nicklaus, uh, as I say, uh, Jim Colbert, uh, Raymond Floyd, Arnold Palmer, um, Gary Player. Those were all those those players that started the, the senior tour. And, you know, when they started the senior tour, it was more of a tour of celebrating these guys. But then as, as they started playing the senior tour, they were playing pretty well. So they didn't want to start keep calling them seniors. You know, over the years, they changed it to the PGA Champions Tour. It became very competitive. They started getting a lot of sponsor money. In fact, the gentleman who is now the, uh, the president of the Champions Tour, I met him at Riviera when he was uh, the director of the LA Open. And I met him the first year that Tiger Woods played in a professional tournament. He was a young amateur, and he played in the LA Open. And then Greg McLaughlin, who's the president of the Champions Tour now, he became the head of the Tiger Woods Foundation. So all those relationships I had over those years of different, different ways of meeting people have all, they've really been wonderful threads for me to be involved in the golf community at a level that it probably wouldn't have happened if I was in Detroit. It was because of being in Hawaii. There weren't a whole lot of other people doing what I was doing. Uh, my love of the game, the fact that I, I could play a pretty good game. In fact, in 1998, when Arnold won the senior skins at Montelani, I told the director of golf there, I'm going to go play in some tournaments. He gave me a set of rental clubs, and I did come here, and I played in some on the Futures Tour. Yeah, which is now the Symmetra Tour, part of the LPGA. But in those days, all you had to do was send in your, your $300, and that's how you got in. <laughs> Nowadays, you got to be of LBGA caliber. Well, that must have been cool, playing those 
It was very cool. I wasn't very good, you know, compared to how I had been in earlier days. And, but I had a couple tournaments. I came here and played in one in Michigan. Didn't play so well, but I had a couple in California where I, I never made the cut of one. But enough so that I, like, well, I've still got a little bit of game there. And, I mean, I was hitting five woods when the, the, the ladies that were regulars on those tours were hitting seven irons, you know. But the beauty of it is it got me back into the game. Uh, I started playing a lot of golf. I don't play so much now, but I hit balls a lot. And I hit balls just enough because every year I play in the, the Pro-Am out there at the, it's now called the Mitsubishi Electric Championship at Hualalai. You might hear every time a Champions Tour player wins a tournament, just like when guys win the Super Bowl, they say, we're going to Disneyland. Well, what the Champions Tour players say when they win a Champions Tour event, I get to go to Hualalai, which is the Four Seasons Resort where the Mitsubishi electric championship is held you have to have won a tournament with the champions tour to be invited to that and they get a five-year exemption if they win a championship and if it's just a regular tournament they have a two-year exemption but they all love coming there because that four seasons resort is the most popular four seasons resort in the whole system of four seasons so i feel very grateful to on the Big Island, I've had some wonderful times. I've played with Marco Mira and Craig Stadler and Joe Durant and, you know, made a lot of friends there. Is, Jay Craig, is Craig Stadler as much fun he oh, seems to be? He, oh, he is a ball. And I, I love, they were back last year. They didn't play last year, but spent some time with them. And, and Jay Don Blake, I've become very good friends with he and Marsha. He brought 29 family members because whenever the players... Uh, get that exemption to come over to Hawaii to play in the Mitsubishi Electric Championship. They all bring their families. Olin Brown. I've, I, I've made a lot of friends uh, from that tour. Hale Irwin and his wife, uh, Sally. Yeah, it's very great. It's been Gary Player and his wife when they used to come every year. It's, it's been very special. And that, because of the small market there, I think is why I was able to get so close to everybody. Along the way, you were mentioning working with ESPN. So you almost have a third career as a broadcaster. Well, you know, I I always wore a lot of hats, and, and uh, the way I got into doing radio was that every time I would take a client when I was doing PR, if I, every time I'd go to um, take a client, I always felt they didn't do their homework well enough. <laughs> and um, it's always nice to have people wave to you when you're doing things right in the Detroit Foundation <laughs> Hotel. Uh, so I decided I need to be on the other side of the microphone. I don't want to be bringing clients and being interviewed. I want to be doing the interviewing. So I got involved doing a community affairs show with a radio show on the Big Island. And then from that, it evolved to just doing more and more radio. I started doing public access TV, did a lot of TV, you know, because all these players were really... I mean, I have just wonderful interviews with Arnold and Jack and Gary Player, and a lot of them I'm kind of curating now, but in those days I, I did a lot of that. And I kind of, I was sort of self-taught, you know, kind of pulling it along behind me. But the opportunity was there. I mean, I wasn't like in the midst of all kinds of media people trying to get interviews with these people. I was creating relationships, and there weren't a lot of media people. I was one of the few, really, with a TV camera. And, and then the, the radio evolved from one to another, and then ESPNHawaii.com ended up with a, an affiliate on the Big Island, and that was a natural. They asked me to, if I wanted to do a show with them. So I did that for about seven years. And even seven years. And How often did the show air? I ran, ran it uh, every week, and one of the, it kept me. Yeah, which is which was really tedious, and one of the reasons I kind of drifted away from that was that when we first started the show, it would be 18-minute segments, and you stop, and you have commercials, and I was always having to look at the clock, and pretty soon I started developing my own way that I wanted to do it, and I got a really fairly expensive recorder, and I went out and did one in the field instead of inviting my guests to come into the studio. And I turned it into the radio station, and they said, my God, what, are you, what did you use? You know, because they knew I didn't come into the studio. And I said, is the quality good? And they said, it's great. So from there I learned, which is what I wanted to do. I didn't want to have to go into a studio. I wanted to be able to walk around a tournament or anywhere I went to cover sports and have this recorder. This was before iPhones and before... I was going to say, what, what was the recorder? It was called, uh, it was called um, uh, Audio Track. And I remember the first one cost me about $700. And, uh, you know, having to learn how to use it, and you had a little, it was, you know, it was technology. Well, in real time, while you're also trying to think of questions to ask somebody. You know, that's never been hard for me. <laughs> it's, the, it's the learning when to zip it. <laughs> so I'll let you ask a few more questions. <laughs> well, Emily, your, your, your connection with Detroit is, continues to be solid. And one of the exciting things that happened recently, this is kind of as a way to wrap up, is there's this beautiful watch named after you. Tell us about 
Shinola and the Watch. Well, about four years ago, Shinola reached out to me. They were opening a dog park up in Midtown. And they op reached out to me to come cut the ribbon for the dog park opening. <laughs> so, which I love because it, that was a really big thing that a dog park was going to be set up in the, the Midtown Cass Corridor area. I mean, there's dog parks now, but even four years ago, there weren't very many in Detroit. So I came and it was a very celebratory a day. And, and what was really fun was on that day, so many people came up to me, like Janet Jones, who has the Source Bookstore across the street from the dog park. She's in her 80s now. And she said, I ran in your runs. I still have the plaque, you know, the same thing I get all the time from people. And so, so many people came up to me and, and the relationship, I just hit it off with the people at Shinola. And they really, just like Bob Lambert here at the Detroit Foundation Hotel, they listened to my stories, but they also would go out and ask. They were finding out that there was a whole lot of history to the say nice things about Detroit. They created a party that night that was to come meet Emily T. Gale and, you know, those of you that ran in her runs. And that was really a nice gesture on their part. And people did come down and, and we had a nice party that night. And, and so it was just a growing relationship. And then one day uh, they, they called me and sent a note that, hey, we're going to create a watch called The Gale. And it's going to be in tribute to you and to say nice things about Detroit and all, the, all that you've done. So a pretty nice um, gesture. I always say it's a gesture to me, but really it's a gesture to everybody from Michigan runner, everybody that ran in our runs, everybody that volunteered for our runs, everybody that ever came into the store, the people that really supported the Say Nice Things About Detroit message. That message was not a slogan. It wasn't really a campaign. It was a grassroots message, grassroots movement. And so I always say that the, the, the Gale Watch was a tribute to everybody that did then and does now, continues to say nice things about Detroit wherever they live, work, and play. Well, Emily, it's just been a wonderful morning. It went faster than I could possibly have imagined. And one of the things I want to underscore is you've had an amazing career as an athlete, a promoter, and a community organizer in, in many ways. And all of this is you were pre-Title IX, as I am, which is 1972 is when Title IX was passed and basically said, you got to let the girls play. Before that, it was much harder. It was much harder. And, but you know, at the same time, when I look back at it, in some ways, I, I see it as been something that worked in my favor because I probably worked harder at my sports. And I've always been kind of a, a I like to spend a lot of time alone. And so I didn't really learn about team sports a lot because we didn't have that many sports in high school. But um, I like that part about myself, that I love being alone. I mean, even now, I don't go out and play a lot of rounds of golf. I go hit balls. So I think I really found what it is I like about sports. I'm a solitary runner. I, I've hardly run in an organized run since the mid the 1980s. I did ultra runs and, and ultra marathons and stuff like that, which is kind of a solitary sport. And so maybe in some ways, you know, I always say to the young kids when I interview them, do you know why you're on a wrestling team, a girls wrestling team, or why you can do this? It's because of Patsy Mink, who was the one who created Title IX. She was a senator from Hawaii. And it was actually, she created that bill as, as to advocate arts and, and music. And the ripple effect was Title IX with sports. And I have to say, you know, when you mentioned still being a community organizer, my relationship with Bob Lambert and Detroit Foundation Hotel is one of the reasons I keep coming back here because they've given me the encouragement. Detroit Homecoming, which is an event that started five years ago that celebrates expats and how much we can continue to contribute to the city. It's the people that have, have gotten behind me currently that respect the past and want to integrate the past history with the present. They aren't here like saying, look at us, look what we're doing. They're like, hey, look what people did before us. And they're, they're letting us be a part of what they're doing currently today. So I, I'm really grateful. Well, Emily T. Gale, it's been wonderful celebrating Detroit and learning the history of all those things that you did. So everybody, say nice things about Detroit.